Welcome to section 25 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video, we'll be discussing Bordetella pertussis, which you can see right here. This scene takes place during medieval times near a castle. A castle has a very protective border surrounding the inside, and in this image, we can also see two border patrol guards who are sitting just outside of the entrance. Border sounds like Bordetella, so the border around the castle and the two border patrol guards should help you remember that this image is all about Bordetella pertussis. Before we go any further, pay attention to the background. Notice that we've intentionally made it red and pink, which is to help you remember that Bordetella is a gram-negative organism. This is a gram stain of Bordetella. Notice that the organism is red or pink appearing, and in some areas it appears circular or caucus shaped and in other areas, it looks a bit more rod or bacilli shaped. This is why Bordetella is considered a gram-negative coccobacillus. Okay, let's return to the image. Notice that now we've included two wooden boards that are blocking the entrance to the castle. The ruler over this castle must be really concerned about not letting anyone inside of the robust border. Anyway, board sounds kind of like borde, so we've included the boards in this image to help you remember that Bordetella can be isolated with borde jangu agar. This is a type of agar that contains potato extract, blood, and an antibiotic. This is hardly ever used anymore, but it still may show up on step one, so it's worthwhile memorizing. A more common medium used nowadays is called Reagan Low Medium. To help you remember this, we've shown very prominent sun rays coming down from the sky and shining very brightly onto the castle. Ray sounds like Reagan, so it's here to help you remember that Bordetella can be isolated on Reagan Low Medium. This is an image of Reagan Low Agar. Notice that it's black, which is because the agar contains charcoal. It also contains blood and an antibiotic. You can see colonies of Bordetella growing on the plate, for example, right here. Okay, let's return to the image. Now let's cover the four toxins of Bordetella pertussis. The first toxin we'll discuss is the pertussis toxin. To help you remember this toxin, we've shown two archers shooting a G.I. Joe guy. As you can see, the arrows have been pretty lethal because they're causing the G.I. Joe guy to fall to the ground. The G.I. Joe guy is our symbol for the G.I. subunit, and the fact that he's getting knocked down with arrows should help you remember that the G.I. subunit is disabled. So G.I. Joe guy getting knocked down with arrows for pertussis toxin disables the G.I. subunit. The G.I. Joe guy is part of this opposing force that is attempting to place the castle under siege. You can see the tents of the opposing force off to the right side of the image. Just like in our other images, we've included the tents in this image to help you remember cyclic AMP. The tents in this image actually have two meanings. First, they represent that when pertussis toxin ribosylates the GI subunit, it disables it, which results in increased levels of cyclic AMP. Second, they're here to help you remember the second toxin of Bordetella, which is known as adenylate cyclase toxin, and this toxin also increases levels of cyclic AMP. So as you can see, the pertussis toxin and the adenylate cyclase toxin both increase levels of cyclic AMP, which ultimately results in edema and phagocyte dysfunction. The third toxin is called tracheal cytotoxin. To represent this, we've shown several rocks on a tray that are releasing a toxic gas. These rocks will be used in the siege, which we'll talk more about in a second. Anyway, tray sounds like trachea, so the toxic rocks on top of the tray should help you remember this toxin. As you could hopefully deduce from the name, trachea toxin is toxic to the trachea. More specifically, it damages the respiratory epithelium and may be responsible for the violent cough associated with Bordetella. The fourth and final toxin of Bordetella is filamentous hemagglutinin, or FHA. This toxin is a pillus-like rod that facilitates the attachment of Bordetella to ciliated epithelial cells. To help you remember this toxin, we've shown a soldier pulling on the catapult with a rope. The rope represents a filament and attaches to the catapult, just like the filamentous hemagglutinin attaches to the respiratory epithelium. So rope pulling catapult for filamentous hemagglutinin. In addition to the toxic rocks, notice that now we've also shown several other rocks with a kind of purple hue. The shape and color of these rocks resemble lymphocytes when viewed under the microscope, and are here to help you remember that Bordetella causes a lymphocytosis. This is a pretty high yield point because acute bacterial infections rarely cause a lymphocytosis, but Bordetella is an exception. A lymphocytosis is most commonly associated with viral infections. So remember, Bordetella causes a lymphocytosis. Okay, now let's move on to discuss the three clinical stages of Bordetella. The first stage is called the catarrhal stage. To help you remember this, we've shown a catapult in the image because catapult sounds kind of like catarrhal. This stage typically lasts one to two weeks and is characterized by several non-specific symptoms, which we'll discuss now. Notice that now we've shown a guy standing between the catapult and the tray of toxic green rocks. As you can see, a lot of smoke is surrounding this guy, so he naturally begins to cough. 
This guy coughing next to the catapult is here to help you remember that a mild cough is commonly seen during the catarrhal stage. Next, notice that we've shown another guy next to the catapult who's holding up a lamp. Just like in our other videos, the lamp represents fever and is here to help you remember that a fever is commonly seen during the catarrhal stage. Finally, notice that we've added another catapult to the image. Let's zoom up on this so you can see it a bit better. As you can see, this catapult is being loaded up with onions. No wonder the guy in charge of this catapult is sneezing and rubbing his eyes. Anyway, this part of the scene is here to help you remember that coryza is commonly seen during the catarrhal stage. Coryza simply means excessive lacrimation and conjunctival injection. So just think of this guy who's standing next to a bunch of onions with watery eyes. Okay, now let's discuss the second clinical stage, which is known as the paroxysmal stage. To help you remember this, we've shown a bunch of rocks starting to fall down on top of the castle. The army that sieged the castle must have catapulted some rocks up above on the mountain nearby, causing an avalanche to occur. Anyway, rock sounds like parox, so we've shown several rocks falling down to help you remember the paroxysmal stage. This stage is the worst part of the infection and typically lasts two to three months. As the rocks hit the castle, a bunch of dust went flying into the air, and now we can see a bunch of guards inside of the castle coughing. Let's zoom up on these guys so you can see this a bit better. Wow, they look like they're coughing really hard. I guess this should be expected considering how much dust is flying around them in the air. Anyway, this part of the image is here to help you remember that the paroxysmal stage is associated with severe coughing spells. This is classically described as a paroxysmal cough because patients experience a series of severe coughing episodes followed by an inspiratory whoop. If we zoom out a bit, you can see that now we've shown one guard who was coughing so hard he started to vomit. This is to help you remember that the paroxysmal stage is associated with post-tussive vomiting. Okay, now let's zoom out and discuss the third and final stage. Notice that we've shown four convicts escaping. They must have managed to escape from the castle during all of the chaos. Anyway, convict sounds like convalescent, so this part of the image is here to help you remember the convalescent stage. These convicts are running quite quickly and appear to be relatively healthy, which should help you remember that during this phase, patients gradually recover, so the frequency and severity of coughing spells decreases. So convicts for convalescent stage. Okay, now that we've discussed the three stages, let's move on to discuss treatment. First, notice that we've shown zippers on the tents. Zipper sounds like azithromycin, so it's included in this image to help you remember that azithromycin can be used to treat Bordetella. However, the diagnosis is usually not made until relatively late in the course of the disease, and at this point, the antibiotic probably doesn't decrease the severity or length of the disease because the toxins have already done their damage. In these instances, the antibiotic is usually given to decrease the spread of the infection. Finally, notice that we've shown a medic who's running towards the castle with a syringe. He must have seen the G.I. Joe guy get hit by the arrows, so he's now running to his rescue. Anyway, just like in our other videos, the syringe is in this image to help you remember that a vaccine is available for Bordetella pertussis. There are actually two names you need to be familiar with regarding this vaccine. The first name is DTAP, or DTAP, which is diphtheria tetanus acellular pertussis. And this vaccine is commonly given to children as a three-dose series. The second is TDAP, or Tdap, which is typically used as a single booster for adolescents or adults. Both vaccines are similar, but DTAP typically contains more pertussis antigens and diphtheria toxoid. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A two-year-old unvaccinated boy is brought to the emergency department due to difficulty breathing. His mother states that she first noticed his symptoms approximately two weeks ago, which included a mild cough, a runny nose, and intermittent sneezing. Recently, the cough has become so severe that he has had trouble breathing and has vomited several times afterward. Physical examination reveals episodes of severe coughing spells followed by a forced expiratory grunt. Laboratory analysis reveals a lymphocytosis. The most likely causal organism produces a toxin that A. inactivates the 60S ribosome, B. increases the activity of guanylate cyclase, C. increases the activity of adenylate cyclase, or D inactivates elongation factor 2. Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this boy is unvaccinated, has a lymphocytosis, and is presenting with a whooping cough, which we can conclude based upon his severe coughing spells followed by a forced expiratory grunt. He also has had post-tussive emesis, which just means that he has vomited after a severe coughing episode. Collectively, these signs and symptoms are pretty classic for Bordetella pertussis. So with this in mind, we can conclude that the correct answer must be C, increases the activity of adenylate cyclase. From the image, recall that the paroxysmal stage is characterized by severe coughing, which is represented by these guards coughing right here. 
Also recall that it can be associated with postessive emesis, which is represented by this guard vomiting over here. Finally, the tents and people camping over on the right side of the image are here to help you remember that the pertussis toxin overactivates adenylate cyclase, which results in increased levels of cyclic AMP. Likewise, the adenylate cyclase toxin increases levels of cyclic AMP. A is incorrect because this is describing shiga toxin and shiga-like toxin. These toxins are associated with shigella and enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which are classically associated with bloody diarrhea. So A is incorrect. B is incorrect because this is describing the heat-stable toxin associated with enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is also associated with diarrhea. So B is incorrect. Finally, D is incorrect because this is describing the diphtheria toxin of Carinibacterium diphtheriae and exotoxin A of Pseudomonas arginosa. Carinibacterium diphtheriae can cause pharyngitis and is associated with pseudomembrane formation in the posterior pharynx. This can present with respiratory distress if the pseudomembrane is obstructing the airway, but the cough and prodromal symptoms described in the question stem make this unlikely. Pseudomonas can cause pneumonia, which can cause difficulty breathing, but this typically presents with fever, chest pain, and a cough without the prodromal symptoms described in the question stem. It also would likely result in a leukocytosis, not a lymphocytosis. So D is incorrect, and again, the correct answer is C, increases the activity of adenylate cyclase. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about Bordetella pertussis.